Okay, hello class. In this video, we're going to be talking about the um, final review, which in an essence is essentially just the unit four review. Okay. So um, there are about there are 20 questions. There are a couple of problems that have multiple parts. So there's um, 23 points out of the entire assignment. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started. I did already prepare the problem so that way it wouldn't take too much time to cover the video. The longer the videos, the less likely you are to watch them. So I do try to keep them as short as possible. I know it's some heavy content, so sometimes the videos do last a little bit longer. Um, but for number one, it's asking us about uh, to determine whether the vector field is conservative. So remember the definition of conservative. If the derivative of the first component with respect to y is equivalent to the derivative of the second component with respect to x, then um, that vector field is uh, conservative. So in this instance, I took the derivative of the first component and I got 9 over x. Then I took the derivative of the second component and ended up with 18x over y squared. And those two were not equivalent. Therefore, this vector field was not conservative. If it is not conservative, then I cannot come up with the potential function. The potential function is essentially um, the function where if I take the partial derivatives, I will end up with these two uh, functions here. Okay, so it's kind of like this where the, if this were the gradient and I need to figure out what the original vector field was. Okay. Um, so for in number two, this one is has opposite is condition. So I did take the partial derivatives with respect to y for the first component and with respect to x for the second component. And those actually were equivalent. One does equal one. So this one was conservative. So I took the integral of the first component with respect to x, because remember, that's kind of what a gradient is, right? The first um, component is the derivative with respect to x. And the second component is the derivative with respect to y. OK, so if I want to know what would it start with before I got these as partial derivatives, I need to take the integral. OK, so I did the integral of the first component with respect to x. I did get y times x. And of course, it could have any other terms with just y or just constants, um, since when you take the derivative of this with respect to x, all of these uh, terms that just have y would all go to zero. Um, similar to the, the, the constant of integration, right? The capital C. Um, it's just that now that you're doing partial derivatives, that C could be um, variables, just the variables of that are that do not match the um, respective variable that you took the uh, derivative of. Okay. Um, so then the same thing we did over here on the right hand side, we took the integral with respect to or the integral of the second component with respect to y. So we got uh, x, y. And again, same motion. We could have terms with just x. And when I take the derivative with respect to y, they would all go to zero. And I'd end up with just this x here. Um, I'm saying if I take the derivative with respect to y, uh, these guys would all go to zero. And the derivative of this with respect to y would be that x. So then Normally, what you would do is you would go over to the right hand side and see if you have any terms that just have y in them, and that would be your gy. And you would go over here and see if there were any terms that just had x, and that would be your g of x. And then your potential function would have what they had in common with both variables, plus any x terms that, they, um, that only were shared in one side, any y terms that were only shared on the other side, and then, of course, your actual constant of uh, integration, which in this case, they used a K instead of a C. That's just a dummy variable. You could whatever use whatever letter you want to represent that uh, constant number, like five or negative five, right? Just a constant. Um, now for number three, they asked us to find the curl. So I did set this up here. Um, I wrote down the vector field in component form. I wrote down the given point that they gave us. And then I set it up. So it's i, j, k, and then d, d, x, d, d, y, d, d, z, and then each component in the specific order. And so I did this computation minus this computation, comma, a negative, this computation minus this computation, and then this computation minus this computation. OK. And so when I took all of the partial derivatives, I ended up with this for the first component. 
Here, that partial derivative was zero. Here, you get negative x squared, but the negative and the negative turned it into positive x squared. Here, we took the partial derivative of this. It was negative 2z, and the partial derivative of x squared z with respect to y was just zero. I know I'm talking fast, but I'm trying to um, get through the video as fast as possible just in respect of your time. You can slow the video down in uh, YouTube. It does give you the availability to slow it down. You can even click the option of how fast you want or how slow you want to slow it down, right? Um, so you can put me like at a slower pace if I'm talking way too fast, okay? And in other sections when I'm talking really, really slow, you could even speed me up, okay? Um, that's all up to you. Some people just, you know, wait till I change the page and then they just go to the next page. How you view the video is completely up to you, okay? Um, but anyway, I ended up with this um, vector here. So then I evaluated it at my point five negative nine one and plugging in all of those respective variables, we ended up with this vector and it did turn out to be correct. And you can always pause the video, take a closer look at everything that I've done there so that it will make sense, okay? Now, number four is just asking us for the divergence. So essentially what that is, is the derivative with respect, it's basically the gradient, but you're adding up all the terms together instead of keeping it in a vector, okay? Um, so the gradient is this thing, right? And when you take the gradient, it's d dx of the first component, d dy of the second component. And if you have a third component, d dz of the third component, okay? So it could be just two dimensional, it could be three dimensional. This one is just two dimensional. So basically what I'm doing is I'm taking that derivative plus this derivative, okay? And so I kind of wrote it out, the derivative of the first term with respect to X plus the derivative of the second term with respect to Y. And then I found those two partial derivatives and there was nothing, no like terms to combine or anything like that. So that was just it. Um, number five asked us to do the divergence, but at a particular point. So I do have three terms here. So I did the derivative with respect to X for the first component and I got YZ. Derivative of the second component with respect to Y, I got X. And then derivative of the third component with respect to Z, I got one. And then I just plugged in this X value, this Y value and this Z value were applicable. And I ended up with um, uh, one times one, which was one. And then X was three and then one just stayed one. And so the ultimate result here was five. Now, number six asks us to evaluate um, the line integral along this path. And so the path that they gave me was in um, component form, sine t, cosine t, and nine. And the t value was going from zero to pi over five. So in order for me to figure this out, I did have to find r prime. So the derivative of each component. Um, and then once I figured out that, I had to figure out what X, Y, and Z were. Now remember, um, in some of the cases, they used M, N, and P to represent each component. For these line integrals, they use X, Y, and Z. So it's like this represents the X coordinate, the Y coordinate, and the Z coordinate, which takes it back to what we were used to from the very beginning when they introduced vectors, right? Um, so you're basically taking each of those derivatives and those are the numbers that we got here. So, and the reason why I put them in X, Y, Z is so that when you type it all in the formula, it makes sense, okay? So you definitely have to put in uh, these variables. So X is gonna become sine T squared, Y squared is gonna become cosine T squared, and then Z is gonna become nine squared. And then on the inside, it's supposed to be X prime squared plus Y prime squared plus Z prime squared. Um, and then my variable here is T and the T goes from zero to pi over five. From there, it was just a matter of simplifying it. So sine squared plus cosine squared is just one. Nine squared is 81. Again, when I square this negative sine squared, negative sine T, it will turn into a positive sine squared. So cosine squared plus sine squared is also one and then zero squared is zero. So ultimately I ended up with 82 times the square root of one or 82 times one, which is just 82. 
I integrated 82 with respect to T. I got 82T. I evaluated it at my bounds and I ended up with this value here. Okay. Number seven. So number seven, I wrote my vector field in this component form. I wrote my vector valued function in component form. And I also changed my house into an exponent, okay? Because I know I'm gonna have to find R prime and I definitely need um, the derivative in order to do that, okay? Um, and I need, I don't, I do my derivatives of radicals with exponents, okay? So I wrote it down as an exponent. I brought down my exponent, kept my base the same, decreased the exponent by one, and then used a chain rule multiplied by the derivative of what's inside the base, okay? Um, and so then I tried to simplify that a little bit. This two and this two would cancel. I would have negative T times this. And a negative half exponent means a radical in the denominator. So I rewrote it as a fraction. So when I'm trying to find F dot dr, that's the same thing as saying F dot r prime, okay? So this is the same as saying r prime. Now remember when you are doing this r prime you do have basically like a dt because you're doing the derivative with respect to t informally i didn't write that dt in there but that's going to explain why this is there okay so f i'm going to plug in the x and i'm going to plug in the y so i get this for the f in terms of t and then i took the r prime and i put it here then i took that dot product by multiplying the first two components and then multiplying the second two components. And of course, adding them up together. Here, these cancel. So I basically ended up with 7t and then minus 6t, which is just t. I integrated t and then I plugged in my bounds and I actually ended up with the value zero after that. So now in this problem, they're asking us to find, uh, again, the uh, integral along a path and it says the path is the arc on this function with, um, it says going from zero to zero to, and then to four, eight. So essentially the X values are going from zero to four and the Y values are going from zero to eight. And in order for me to figure this out, I did have to know what DY was. And so the derivative of Y is DY, the derivative of this is three halves X to the one half DX. So I plugged everything in, I plugged in, um, the expression that we had for y, and I plugged in the expression we had for y again, and then the expression that we had for x. And so since both of these terms do have dx, I just kind of worked with the groups together. So this is, these two came down. Here, I actually distributed. So this three halves x to the one half times x made three halves x to the three halves, then three halves x to the one half times three x to the three halves became nine over two x squared. Um, you have to add those exponents and three halves plus one half is four halves, which is just two, okay? Um, then I combined any of the like terms here. So I noticed that these two terms were like terms. So I did combine those. Um, negative one plus three halves is just a positive one half. Um, and then I did actually take the integral of each one of those terms. And then I evaluate, I simplified it first and then I evaluated it at my bounds. I use the calculator as least amount as possible. Some people don't. So some people might have typed all that in the calculator um, and it will do that problem for you and tell you that this is the answer because it is a single integral, a single definite integral, meaning it has bounds. Um, if you wanna see that real quick, I can show you because it could come in handy as far as time conservation on the test. So zero, four, and then in here you would type two, x um, plus fraction one over two, go to the side, x raised to the three over two, get down, get down, plus fraction nine over two, and then x squared. And so if I hit enter, it looks like it's taking a little bit to think. But normally after a while, it will come up with an answer. I don't know what's going on here. My calculator froze, I just broke it. <laughs> I'll give that a minute, but hopefully it does give us this 592 over five. Oh, there it goes, it finally worked. It gave me this. If I hit my double arrow, it will convert it. Oh, it does not want to convert it to a fraction. Um, no. 
So let's see, uh, what's the denominator five? So let's do 118.4 times five, and that's 592. So it is 592 over five. You could also have done this, 592 divided by five, and it's the same value that we got, okay? Um, so it does do those, those particular problems for you, but just a single integral, all with one variable. And it only does with respect to x. So for number nine, it asks us to do, um, find this integral here. Um, and it wanted us to do it for both parts. So depending on what the parameters are, okay? So for the first parameter, I did, I did write the vector value, I mean, the vector field in component form. And then I wrote the vector valued function for the first one as t and t squared, t going from zero to one. So the derivative of this was one and two t. And so if I take the vector field and plug in this component for x and this component for y, we end up with t squared and t cubed. So then to uh, solve this, it's zero to one, the f in terms of t, and then the r prime dt, okay? Um, and so what we end up with after we do this dot product is essentially t squared plus 2t cubed. And I integrated each of those individually, plugged in my bounds, and ended up with the value 11 over 15. Now, essentially, what's supposed to happen is these things are supposed to be independent of, um, because this is a conservative vector field. So if I take the derivative of this with respect to y, right, and y would be, um, with respect to y, no, it would be zero. And then the derivative or the derivative of this one with respect to x would be y. So it's not particularly conservative, but I think what they were showing here was independence of path for this particular problem, okay? Um, and so then if you took another path, they essentially wanna show that you do end up with the exact same thing, okay? So we have this path here, sine and sine squared, theta from going from zero to pi over two, so I took the part, or took the derivatives with respect to theta. I plugged in this for x and this for y into f. f was originally was originally x squared x y, right? So I plugged in this for x, and then I plugged in this for y. So x and y. So I had sine and sine squared. So then I ended up with sine squared and sine cubed. Okay. So I took the dot product. I ended up with this. And then I think I factored out the cosine that they had in common. And then I used u substitution. So I let u equal sine, the derivative of sine is cosine. So it turned into this with respect in terms of u. Then I took the integral of each um, term in, with respect to u. I did not plug in my bounds yet because my bounds were for theta. I did not ever convert my bounds. So what I had to do is go back to thetas. So u was sine theta. So I just basically plugged in sine theta for u. And then I plugged in my bounds, OK? And then I ended up with this 11 over 15, just the same. So number 10 is doing this integral, but using Green's theorem. So Green's theorem states that this should be equivalent to this. So in this case, um, this here is your m. And this here is your n, okay? So I established that and I labeled them over here. And then I also found my and nx so that I could fill in the values here. And it just so happens to be constant, okay? And so then I'm really essentially only integrating the number one, okay? But what would my bounds be? So it gave me the path y equals x and the region lying between y equals x and x squared minus two. So what I did was I tried to find their points of intersection to figure out what region that would be. So I set them equivalent to each other. It was an x squared function, so I moved over the x. I factored out the x, and then I set each factor equal to zero, resulting in these two x values. So supposedly these graphs intersect when x is zero and when x is three. So I graphed both of them. I drew the little graph. I went one, two, three. And then I plugged in zero into both functions, found those coordinates, plugged in one, both of them found those coordinates, plugged in two, and then eventually plugged in three. And then one was a straight line and the other was a squared curve. So that helped me come up with this region that we were talking about. 
Okay. Now, when doing this region, your y's would be going from this bottom function to the top function. The bottom function happens to be the x squared minus 2x. And the top function happens to be the linear function, which is y equals x. So that's why my bounds went from the bottom function to the top function. And then the x's were the values. And the values went from 0 to 3. And so that's why my x bounds were 0 to 3. So now I integrated 1. I got y. I plugged in my bounds. I ended up with this expression. I distributed my negative, combined my like terms, and ended up with this function. I integrated both of those terms with respect to x, then plugged in my boundaries, and I ended up with this value here. OK? Um, so the mechanics of it shouldn't really be the issue. It's mostly just the setup that's the, that's the issue, OK? Um, so number 11, now we're doing this integral. It's a surface integral. Um, and so then I definitely, they gave us this function, z, and they gave us these bounds. So these bounds and the z basically help us figure everything out. So I do have to take the derivative of this with respect to x, which is negative 1, and the derivative of this with respect to y is just 0. So I did plug in z here, and I combined my like terms, and I actually ended up with negative 2y plus 4. Um, and then when I go to figure out the formula, it has to be this function here that we were supposed to evaluate, and then times the square root of zx squared plus zy squared plus 1, and then the region would just be in terms of dy and dx, uh, y going from 0 to 3, and x going from 0 to 4. And then from there, it's just the mechanics of it. So I simplified the radical. I got square root of 2. Eventually, I kicked the square root of 2 out. I integrated each of these two terms. I evaluated those terms at the bounds. And I ended up with the square root of 3, or square root of 2 times the integral of 3 dx which means I basically end up with the constant 3 square root of 2 times x, and I still have to evaluate it at my bounds, 4x, and I ended up with the value 12 square root of 2. Again, you can always pause that to like make sure you see all the mechanics of it, but um, in a nutshell, that is what happened. Okay, number 12. So number 12, we have this problem here. It gives us, um, it wants us to evaluate this integral. So our function they gave us is going to be y plus 2x. Our conditions here are going to be in component form, u, v, and 2v. u going from 0 to 1, and then v going from 0 to 5. So I did find um, u, r, u, and r, v. And so that would have been 1, 0, 0. And then r, v would have been 0, 1, 2. And so I found uh, RU cross RV by doing the whole the computations. You could view these computations, but this is the result I got for the cross product, okay? Then I had to find the magnitude of that cross product. So the magnitude essentially ended up being um, each of the components squared added together was five. So for Y, I'm gonna plug in what Y is equivalent to and Y is equivalent to V. So this becomes V plus two. And then the ds essentially becomes the radical 5. It's kind of like the Jacobian, right? Um, and then du, dv. So u was going from 0 to 1, and then v was going from 0 to 5. So then now it's the mechanics of it. This is a constant multiplier. The integral of these two terms with respect to u is vu plus 2u. Evaluated at my bounds, I ended up with um, just v plus 2. Then I have to integrate this with respect to v. So there's my constant multiplier, v squared over 2 plus 2v, evaluate it at my bounds, and this is the value that I ended up with. OK, number 13. So number 13 asked us for the uh, flux, and it asked us if, for n, where n is an upward normal vector. So they gave us our vector value function. I wrote it down here in component form. I wrote down the bounds, the surface that we're talking about. I do graph things just because I am a picture person, OK? And so when I'm working these problems out, I do try to come up with visuals when I feel like visuals are necessary. So I'm talking about the first octant. So what I did was I went ahead and figured out all the intercepts, right, by plugging in zeros for x and y, 0 for x and z, and then zeros for um, z and y. And then that helps you to figure out all of those values. Um, then what I did was, is if I'm only talking about the first octant, I'm only really talking about this area in here underneath this, this triangle plane. Um, but in the first quadrant, notice that the x-intercept is 1 and the y-intercept is also 1. 
And the equation of this line is y equals one minus x. Um, so in this, I'm going to go ahead and convert this formula into this formula, okay? Um, equivalencies are covered in the lectures. And then, um, so F itself was this vector. And then if you wanna find G, what you have to do is essentially create a G function. Um, so over here, I did say, I did get everything over to one side. And then what I did was I let my G function equal all of that. And so I have that here. And then if I take the derivative of this function with respect to X, with respect to Y, and with respect to Z, um, this is what I ended up with, okay? Um, and so then that's where this uh, vector came from, the gradient of G and then DA. And when you're doing DA, since we do or are talking about rectangular coordinates, it is going to be dy dx. So um, in this xy plane, my y's are going from zero to the line, and then my x's are going from zero to one. And then the, after doing this uh, dot product, we ended up with these three terms, okay? Now you don't have an integral with respect to z, so I did have to plug in what z was equivalent to. And it does tell me right there what z is equivalent to, okay? So I distributed my six, I combined my like terms, and I ended up with these three terms. I integrated those three terms with respect to y, plugged in my bounds, um, ended up with this. I tried to distribute and simplify as much as possible, and I ended up with all of these terms, okay? Combined my like terms, I ended up with this. Then I integrated each term with respect to x, got this, plugged in my bounds, and eventually ended up with negative one third. So for number 14, in number 14, it was also a problem where they ask us to find the flux. It just so happened that in this problem, rectangular coordinates wasn't the best option, okay? And this court, in this uh, problem, um, this is your, 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 your surface here, and it says z greater than or equal to zero. So what I did was I tried to figure out if it's greater than or equal to zero, then that basically means it's above the xy plane, okay? So I tried to figure out what was going on on the xy plane so that I could figure that out, okay? Um, so to do that, I let z equal to zero, and then I added these two terms over. And so essentially what I ended up was with the equation of a circle with the radius going from zero to one. And since it's the whole circle, the theta should be going from zero to two pi. Then I wrote my function in terms of uh, polar coordinates. So x is r cosine theta, y is r sine theta, and then z, if I convert this over, it's actually one minus x squared plus y squared, which is the same thing as one minus r squared, okay? Um, so that's where this came from. Then as before, you're gonna move all of these terms over to one side. And so when I move all of those terms over to the left side, this becomes my g function. I'm gonna take the partial derivatives with respect to x, the partial derivative with respect to y, and the partial derivative with respect to z. And then I also have to put those in polar coordinates. And so this was the gradient of G. Now, when you are converting into your region, you do have to have the Jacobian R. So it's R dr d theta. I did find this dot product and it got all of this. And then I simplified it as much as possible. And I got this and then eventually simplified it a little bit more down to here. I distributed the R from the Jacobian and then I integrated each term and then I evaluated it at that at the bounds zero to one. And then I integrated this with respect to theta, evaluated at those bounds and ended up with this value here, okay? Now, if you're asking how did I get two R squared, basically I did two R squared, I factored it out from those two terms. Um, and this should have been squared actually. So cosine squared, sine squared, y, because I was multiplying those two together. So it should have been cosine squared. Um, and then this is just one. So it's two R squared times one, which is where that first term just became two R squared. Okay, number 15. Now, this one is asking us to use the divergence theorem. So the divergence theorem is basically, you're gonna do the integral over a whole volume. Um, and so um, for F, we had to find the divergence and the divergence is derivative of this term with respect to x, the derivative of this term with respect to y, and then the derivative of this term with respect to z. 
And they did give me all of my bounds. It told me I was, X is going from zero to A, Y is going from zero to A, and Z is going from zero to A. So I combine my like terms here, I'm doing this integral. I did take the integral, evaluated at the bounds, I ended up with A squared. Took the derivative of this with respect to Y, plugged in my bounds, I ended up with A cubed. Took the derivative of that with respect to X, plugged in my bounds, and I ended up with A to the fourth power. Now number 16. Um, this one is also asking me to do the divergence theorem. So they did give me this function here. The derivative of this with respect to x is 2. Derivative of this with respect to y is negative 2. Derivative of the third component with respect to z is 1. Um, it did give me this surface here. Um, and it says, and it shows me a picture. So I didn't really need to draw it, but I did. Um, and so what I did was, is I just took these coordinates. This was 6. Uh, X intercept of six and a Y intercept of three. And so then I came up with the equation for this. So uh, the equation for this was the Y intercept is three and it's going down three and over six, which reduces to one over two. But because it went down and over, it's a negative slope. So I know that the Y is going from zero to that line, the X is going from zero to six and the Z, according to this region, since it's in the first um, octant, the z is going from zero to that plane, okay? So that helped me set everything up. It just so happened that in here, I just ended up with one. So the integral of one with respect to z is z, plugged in my bounds, got this, took the derivative of, or the integral of these with respect to y, plugged in my bounds, tried to simplify that as much as possible, then took the integral of this with respect to x, and then plugged in my bounds, and I got 18. Again, if you want to see like all the simplifying and want to um, like break that down even slower, just pause the video and kind of examine it that it, we're distributing and then we're combining all of our like terms. Okay. So number 17. Number 17 says for us to do the divergence theorem again. So this is my vector field in component form. There's no I component, just the J component and no K component. The surface that they gave me was X squared plus Y squared equals 36, which is a circle from zero, radius zero to six, and the whole circle would be zero to two pi. It does tell me that the Z is going from zero to two automatically. So I did the divergence, the derivative of that zero, derivative of this with respect to Y is XZ, and the derivative of this with respect to Z is zero. So essentially it's just XZ. Um, because this is going to be in polar coordinates, I did have to convert this into polar coordinates. So I had R cosine theta times Z. So um, the divergence is that R cosine theta times Z, and then the Jacobian R, and then dr d theta dz. So then I multiplied the R's together and got R squared. And so then I need to integrate that with respect to Z first. Um, or I'm sorry, with respect to R. So the integral of r squared with respect to r is r cubed over three. This factor is just there as a constant multiplier. It's actually two factors that are there as constant multipliers. I did evaluate that from zero to six. And excuse me, ended up with 72. Then I took the integral of this factor with respect to theta. Excuse me, I have hiccups now. Evaluated it at my bounds. And then um, when I did evaluate that at my bounds, the sine of 2 pi is 0, the sine of 0 is 0, and 0 minus 0 was 0. So when I do this product, I actually end up with 0. And the integral of 0 is just 0. Okay. So, um, I mean, it could be a constant, but we don't really put the constant. So um, that's just how it ended up being there. Now, number 18, let's go ahead and discuss that one. So for number 18, we have this. Um, hold on one second. Oh my goodness, I cannot pause this video. <laughs> so for number 18, they're asking us to apply Stokes theorem. And they're asking us with this, um, where am I at? So for Stokes theorem, we're going to be using this formula. And instead of using NDS, we're actually going to convert it over into the gradient of GDA so that we can use our um, region that we were given. 
Now it did say triangle with those particular vertices. So I did draw that image. And again, you can review, I know we covered this, you can review how to come up with the equation for that's some old content, right? That's why I meant at the beginning, when I meant that we're gonna be using a lot of the old content to be getting through this particular um, test. So you do write the equation of this, please review how to write the equation of um, a linear, um, oh, what is it called? A, a line in three dimensions, okay? And so this ends up becoming the equation of that line. And so then if I move the three over, this ends up becoming G. So then the gradient of G ends up becoming just one, one, and one, okay? So I do need to know the curl of F and then I do need to know the region. So in two dimensions, um, actually we don't, normally I would write this in the XY plane and go figure out what the equation of that is. And it looks like it's three minus X, but something really interesting happened with this section as I, in this problem, as I keep working through it. So I did find the curl. And so I set up the curl. I found all of the correct partial derivatives and all of that. Um, and this was what I got for the curl. So I put that there, I put the gradient of G and then DA. I did all of this dot product and I ended up with the constant. So remember, when you're taking the double integral with respect to DA, you're essentially gonna end up with the area. And what region are we talking about? We're talking about the area of this triangle that's getting created, okay? Now, if you think about the area of a triangle, think about what's in the XY plane. In the XY plane, you have three and three, so the base is three and the height is three. And so we have three times three over two. And if you do all of this computation, you do end up with negative 27. Now that's just something to notice. If you did not notice that, um, what you also could have done is you could have gone from zero to three for X, zero to three minus X, and then just done negative six um, dy dx. And eventually through all of that computation, um, you should end up with the same negative 27. I'm trying to do it real quick just to see if I can kind of squeeze it in here because I was not planning to do it this other way. Um, zero to three dx. So I ended up with what? Three x squared minus 18 x evaluated from zero to three. So you end up with 27 minus 54, which is the same um, negative 27. So you do actually end up with the same value, even if you had set it up without recognizing that you just had a constant and so it would be just the area. Okay, number 19, we have this. Again, it wants us to apply the Stokes theorem. Oh, I forgot the N when I wrote this down. So it should have been N D S, okay. Um, and so then I went ahead and converted that over into the gradient of G D A. And then again, I found the curl for the vector, um, the vector field that was given. And this ended up being the curl of that vector. Um, I did try to examine what would G be. So I did move all of these terms over to where Z was. And then I got this for G, took the derivatives with respect to X, took the derivatives with respect to Y, took the derivatives with respect to Z. Um, I did let the, the Z equal zero so I could figure out what was going on in the XY plane because I am going to be doing the integral in the XY plane. Um, so then this, moving this over, I ended up with the equation of a circle with the radius of four, okay? Um, so my region is a circle with radius four. And so then radius is gonna go from zero to four, theta is gonna go from zero to two pi, which this is an indicator, I need everything in, um, polar coordinates. So I wrote down the dot product for the curl. I figured while it's as easy as it looks, I should probably do the dot product first and then go convert everything into polar coordinates. So I did go ahead and do that dot product and combine all my like terms. Um, and then I converted everything to polar coordinates. So this became this, this became this thing here, and then that became that, and then dA became r dr d theta. So r going from zero to four, theta going from zero to two pi. So I did uh, factor out the 12 because each one of these terms had the 12. I also factored out the R squared and combined it or multiplied it with this R. And so that's where this R cubed came from. 
Um, from there, I integrated R cubed, plugged in my bounds, and I ended up with another constant multiplier of 64. I also converted this part into cosine of two theta. And so then I took the integral of cosine of two theta. If you need to examine that further, please do. I used u substitution with u equal to two theta. Over here, I did another u substitution, but when this substitution, I let u equal sine and cosine was the u, okay? Um, and then I did that substitution. So you can work on all of that if you want, um, but that, that was essentially what I did there. Then I evaluated it at all my bounds, ended up with a bunch of zeros, and that zero times 768 was just um, zero, okay? Okay, last problem seems to be like the longest problem, but it's not too, too bad considering what we've already done. So for this particular problem, um, we did convert it into the Stokes theorem, and then I further converted the NDS to G, uh, gradient of G dA, so there's my vector field, took the curl, ended up with this vector, um, examined my bounds. So it's z squared over this. So for g, I'm going to move this over. I got g equal to this through partial, right? Find the gradient, partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, partial with respect to z. Um, this is a circle with radius going from 0 to a, although I don't know what a is. It's OK. We can leave that general information out and just use a to represent it. Um, but because it said we were only in the first octant, the first octant means we're only in the first quadrant of the xy plane, okay? And so then in that case, my theta was not going from 0 to 2 pi. It was only going from 0 to pi over 2. If you look at the xy plane, this is the first quadrant, and that's only from 0 to pi over 2. So I did put the product in the dot product in terms of x and y before I converted everything into polar. It's just easier to look at this, in my opinion. So there's the function, there's the uh, gradient of g, took the dot product, combined the like terms, um, plugged in the function for z, so z was equal to x squared, so plug that in, I ended up with this. Then I converted everything over into polar coordinates. So r dr d theta for dA, and then negative r cosine theta cubed for x. I ended up with this, I um, actually ended up with r cubed times an r, so that's where I got r4 integrated that with respect to r, plugged in my bounds, ended up with this constant multiplier. I converted cosine theta into one minus sine theta, and then I distributed that extra cosine. So notice what I did for cosine. I split it into two and one, then converted this cosine squared into this, and then distributed that. Once I had those two terms, I took the integral of the first term and then minus the integral of the second term. But notice that this constant multiplier is out and it applies to everything, okay? Um, so then when I integrated this, I ended up with sine. When I integrated this, I used sine as u and did u substitution and ended up with this. Plugged in all my bounds, I ended up with, um, with this value here, negative two a to the fifth over 15. Again, you can pause that, re-examine it, work it out the in-between steps if you're not understanding how I'm doing the in-between steps. There is a lot of stuff I can do in my head. I try my best not to, but every now and then it just happens naturally um, as I'm working out problems. So I don't write out every single step of my use substitution. But if you have questions about that, please let me know um, and I can break it down for you, no problem, okay? Um, but for conservation of the video, the time of the video, um, I'm gonna leave it at that, okay? But always message me if you have problems with this. If you get stuck on anything that you've seen in the video, if there's anything in the video that didn't make sense, you don't know where it's coming from, um, or you're not capable of doing that, you don't, anything, anything that comes to mind, you can always text me and remind, you can message me in Canvas, you can email me in ACES, many, many ways to get contact with me. Most of you have been trying to contact and reach out throughout the semester, and I really, really appreciate that. But this is the end, so I hope you Take the time to really um, work through the review. It will help you practice all of this stuff um, and then prepare for, for that exam, okay? So we'll be the last and final exam and I will see you on the other side. So good luck everyone and bye-bye.